Hey everyone, my name is Anya Kubo and I will be your instructor for this blockchain development course all about querying data on Web3 decentralized applications. In this course, you will get an introduction into indexing and querying data on the Ethereum blockchain and understand why querying data on decentralized networks is so different to what we are used to on the traditional web. Goodbye HTTP requests, hello subgraphs. We will be doing this with some explainer sections as well as some hands-on experience by building your own querying technology. By the end of this course, you will have the knowledge to query data from the Ethereum mainnet as well as a variety of chains on the hosted service in order to build your own decentralized apps. This course is made possible with a grant from The Graph, creators of the tool we will be using in this video. But first, let's cover just exactly what we will be looking at in this course. First off, we are going to start off by looking at The Graph, a decentralized protocol for indexing and querying data from blockchains. This will include why it was built in the first place and how to use it. Next, we will move on to looking at subgraphs, which are open APIs. We'll discuss how subgraphs help you get the data you need to create and power your own decentralized applications or dApps. We will then move on to the more hands-on approach and cover how to build a subgraph with a step-by-step -step tutorial. Then move on to how to query a subgraph from a front-end application and how to manage your API keys. Once we have built our subgraph, it will then be time to put it to some good use and make some queries with it using tools such as the Graph Explorer, which we will go into how to use together. You will be glad to know that this course will take a very beginner approach. So if this is your first time working with blockchain related topics, you are in safe hands. The only prerequisites I ask of you before starting this course is to have a basic understanding of JavaScript, Node.js and GraphQL. However, if you are not super familiar with both, please have a go at following along anyway, as there is still plenty to learn without coding a thing. Okay, so a very packed course for you today. I'm excited. Let's get to it. As always, please do give us that sub if you like this video, as this is the way this channel can grow and we can continue to create free content for everyone in the free CoCamp community. So we have already covered what the graph is, a decentralized protocol for indexing and querying data from blockchains. But why do we need a protocol for doing so? Well, as some of you may or may not know, most of our activity online today happens on an internet referred to as Web2. Web2 is widely considered to be an internet dominated by companies that provide services in exchange for your personal data. This was considered the norm until the introduction of Web3. Web3 bypasses all the large corporations and companies that Web2 relies on by communicating in a peer-to-peer -peer way. With Web3, we are no longer relying on the companies as our central hub for our services, but rather rely on peer-to-peer -peer protocols. In Web2, users are able to utilize free services in exchange for their personal data, and in Web3, users pay protocols to work for them in exchange for self-sovereignty and privacy. In other words, Web3 is decentralized and looks a lot like this. This meant that whatever we built on Web3 is less reliant on centralized companies whose servers may go down, causing an app to crash, as one of the many examples, and more reliant on a distributed network of lots and lots of individuals. Two great examples of this peer-to-peer -peer networks, or in other words, decentralized networks, are the Ethereum network and IPFS, or the Interplanetary File System Network. Let's start with Ethereum. Now, what you might not know is that it is actually very difficult to query data on the Ethereum blockchain directly. This is because so much of what is stored on the blockchain is stored in a very complex way. So currently when you want to find a file on Web2, you tell the browser exactly where to look for the file you are searching for. This location is essentially your URL. And this method for accessing files is called location-based addressing. This works fine until, you guessed it, the server where your files are stored 
goes offline or hackers manage to take something down and you can't access your files anymore. Web3 overcomes this issue with content-based addressing. This means that with Web3, when requesting a specific resource, you do not request its location, you request what you are looking for instead. And it is most likely spread all over Web3 and not just in one location. So super safe, but hard to query. So while you are able to find a specific thing that you are looking for, more advanced real-world queries and operations like aggregation, search, relationships, non-trivial filtering, or other things you are used to doing with simple structures are just not possible. To get this data, you would have to process every event ever emitted by a smart contract, two phrases we will be looking at next, read the metadata from IPFS using the token ID and IPFS hash, and then aggregate it. Even for these types of relatively simple queries, it would take hours or even days for a decentralized application running in a browser to get a response. You could also build out your own server, process the transactions there, save them to a database, and build an API endpoint on top of it, all in order to query the data. However, this option is resource intensive, needs maintenance, presents a single point of failure, and breaks important security properties required for decentralization. This is where the graph comes in. The graph solves this problem by indexing blockchain data. Once blockchain data is indexed, the graph creates a subgraph that can be queried with your standard GraphQL API. Subgraphs are just open APIs. The graph knows which data to index for your subgraph based on something called your subgraph manifest that you define. So now, thanks to the subgraph manifest and the graph, you are able to query data on the blockchain and our problem is solved. And not only that, we can view the results of our queries in this neat UI right here. Let's have a deeper look at subgraphs and writing subgraph manifests in the next section. As we mentioned, a subgraph manifest, also known as a subgraph description, is something that the graph uses to index the data that you need on the blockchain. We also mentioned that this is something that you define yourself. For example, you can define a subgraph manifest to query the smart contracts you are interested in for a subgraph, the events in those contracts to pay attention to, and how to map event data to data that the graph will store in its database. Smart contracts on the blockchain, for those of you coming across the term for the first time in a nutshell, are pieces of repeatable, executable code. They are stored on the blockchain and run when certain conditions are met. So think, if this happens, then that happens. You can even think of them as a sort of function if you wish. It could be to do with releasing money to stakeholders, sending notifications, or anything really, all in an encrypted way. When conditions are met, smart contracts can emit events. In fact, events are the way you can communicate with your smart contract in general. So when something happens, events are emitted and logs are written to the blockchain. That then your front-end applications can pick up so we know what is going on. Once you have defined your subgraph manifest, you can use the graph CLI or command line interface to store the definitions on the blockchain and tell the indexer to start indexing data for that subgraph. Okay, so think what you want to query, define it, then run the indexer. And that's it. Once you are happy with what you have built and tested it out to see you are getting the correct data back, you can publish your subgraph to the decentralized network. This now means that by using your subgraph and your definition of it, applications can query data served by what is called a query market, comprised of a network of indexes all competing to provide the best indexing service at the best price. This is opposed to how we query things today on Web2, which involves going through a centralized server that just offers one service at one price. Building apps, or in this case, decentralized apps, also known as dApps, is very different from what we are used to today. When building on the blockchain, as we touched on briefly already, data is not stored in an organized way. It is scattered all over the place. 
This is done by design and in layman terms is the reason it is so secure as it is decentralized and not reliant on a centralized source. On the traditional centralized web, databases and APIs query, filter, sort, paginate, group and join data before returning it back to your front end applications, usually thanks to some sort of HTTP request. This is possible as data is organized and indexed. On the blockchain, we are missing both these things, the organization and the indexing layer. This would mean that if someone wanted to build a decentralized app, they would have to build a way to index data by building and operating proprietary indexing servers. This would require a lot of time and energy and each company would probably be doing the same thing. The demand to build a tool that everyone could use that would also standardize the way data was queried was there. Enter the graph. The graph was essentially born out of this core market need. Today, the graph is one of the most used blockchain protocols and has saved a number of companies and developers time and money by building a data querying tool that they no longer have to build themselves. By now, we know why the graph was invented, as well as what we as developers need to do in order to query data on the blockchain. But how do we actually do it? We have now reached the practical part of this course, so let's get up our terminals because I'm going to show you how. First, we are going to have to install the graph CLI, as this is the main thing we will need in order to create our first subgraph. So let's jump right into it and get going. Okay, so as mentioned before, as a developer, we can choose to either use a subgraph that was already developed by another developer, or we can make our own. So we're gonna make our own. In this tutorial, we are gonna build a subgraph for querying NFT data from the foundation smart contract, which you can see here. We are going to write a query for fetching NFTs as well as their owners and build relationships between them so that by the end, when we essentially look all over the Ethereum network, our data will come back like this. Foundation also has a developer portal where they have information about their smart contract code as well as links to their own subgraphs if you want to check this out later. So before we get going with this tutorial, please make sure to have Node.js installed on your machine. Here you can find ways to do this. And for this tutorial, we are gonna be using NVM to manage Node.js versions. So if you don't have those installed, please just go ahead and do that now. Gravitate towards this page right here and just download this onto your machine as well as NVM like so. So all I'm gonna do is just take this script right here and just put it in my terminal and run it. Okay, so once we have these two things done, let's carry on. First off, I'm just gonna to gravitate to the graph.com and on here, I'm gonna select the dropdown hosted services. Once here, you have to essentially make an account. I have signed up using my GitHub account. This has already been done, so it's just gonna take me straight to the platform, and I'm gonna choose to go onto my dashboard, where you can see some subgraphs I have already made as testers, as well as my own. Now, to create our own, just go ahead and click Add Subgraph right here. We're gonna to have to name our subgraph something. So because we are working from the foundation app, I'm just gonna call this foundation app subgraph and give it a quick subtitle. So this can of course be whatever you wish. I'm just gonna fill it out for best practice. And then let's go ahead and leave these two blank. And then we can fill out a description and we can give it a GitHub URL. These two things are optional. Please feel free to fill them out if you wish and just go ahead and click create graph. And great. Now you should be taken to this page right here with some more steps. The first thing we need to do is initialize a new subgraph using the graph CLI. 
So all I'm going to do is view the CLI commands here. So all I'm going to do is view the commands right here to be able to install the graph CLI. Now gravitate to a directory that you want to work in. For me, it's going to be called WebStorm Projects. Once again, I'm using NPM, so I'm going to choose NPM install, and I'm going to install it globally, G is for globally, and I'm going to install graph protocol forward slash graph CLI. Now, I'm going to leave that to run. Once that has been installed, we can essentially initialize a new subgraph with the init command. Okay, so just go ahead and wait for that to finish running. I might as well just zoom this right here. So, and once that is done, let's just gravitate to here. And I'm just going to copy the first command that I see. So this command is to initialize a new subgraph. So all I'm going to do is grab the command and replace the GitHub name with my GitHub name and replace this subgraph name with foundation app subgraph, which is what I called my subgraph. And once again, I'm just going to hit enter on that. Now, there will be some prompts for you. So just go ahead and make sure to select the Ethereum option. And then on the subgraph name, I'm just going to hit enter. I'm happy with that. I'm also happy with the directory that this wants to be created in. I'm also happy with the directory it's going to create my subgraph in so I can view the code. I'm currently once again in my WebStorm projects directory on my computer and I'm just going to hit enter on that. Now here, please uh, select mainnet. Of course, you can choose whatever you wish in the future, but just for this tutorial, we're going to be doing on the Ethereum mainnet. Now, when I ask for a contract address, this essentially is the contact address taken from the foundation NFT contract. Okay, so I have taken this, just take the same one, exact same one that you are seeing here. Uh, pause if you need to take longer on this section. I'm just going to go ahead and click enter for now. And when it next asks you for a contract name, just go ahead and write token. Now, if we hit enter, this command will essentially generate a basic subgraph based of the contract address passed into the argument. So all the little numbers, that's the contract address. It's going to generate a subgraph for us based on this. Okay, so if we now go ahead and look in our directory, we should see a directory called foundation subgraph that has been generated for us thanks to the command above or with the template code that we need to get started. Okay, so there is the project. For those of you using VS Code, you can just open it up using the command code dot if you have that installed or you're going to open it up with whatever code editor you wish. I'm going to choose WebStorm. So I'm just going to go ahead and find that now and open it up. So there we go. And as you will see in here, there we go. There are all our files that have been generated for us. Now I'm going to just go ahead and talk you through some of these. As we mentioned in the explainer, the subgraph manifest, or in other words, how we define our subgraph manifest, is this subgraph.yaml file. Okay, so we've talked that one through. Once again, this is how we define our subgraph. And next, we also have the schema GraphQL file which is a GraphQL schema that defines what data is stored for your subgraph and how to query it via GraphQL. So at the moment, you just see a example entity that has an ID, account, an owner, and approved. So while we are here, actually, I'm going to ask you to change the content of this file to essentially let us query the NFTs in a way that we want. 
So let's go ahead and do that. So all I'm going to do is paste this piece of code that I have pre-written here. Now let's talk it through a little bit. This is essentially GraphQL. With GraphQL, we can define entity types just as we have done here with the type token and type user. The graph will essentially take this and generate top level fields for querying single instances and collections of that entity type. Now, this is important. Each type that should be an entity is required to be annotated with an entity directive. So what we are saying is that we want to index these two entities, okay? These two entities that we are indexing are gonna be the token and the user. This way we can index the tokens created by the users as well as the users themselves. What is also interesting is this derived from right here. By adding this derived from field, we can now do reverse lookups. So essentially what is happening is we are creating a virtual field on the entity that may be queried but cannot be set manually through the mappings API. Rather, it is derived from the relationship defined on the other entity. For such relationships, it rarely makes sense to store both sides of the relationship and both indexing and query performance will be better when only one side is stored and the other is derived. Okay, great. So now that we have defined our schema essentially for the entities, we can generate the entities locally with one simple command. We're going to use the command graph code gen in order to spin up some code. So let's just go ahead and do that. And now if we look in the TS file, some code would have been generated for us based on the two schema that we wrote. If you haven't come across this command before, this command essentially generates assembly script types from a combination of the subgraphs GraphQL schema and the contract ABAs included in the data sources. By using this command, we are essentially making everything type safe. Now, let's move on to the subgraph YAML file where we're gonna to have to update some things based on what we have just done. So the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is just head over to the data sources mapping entities and just add the user and the token entities, just like so. Next up, let's move on to the data sources mapping event handlers. And I'm gonna actually get rid of all these event handlers as we don't need them anymore. That was just the template code. And I'm just gonna add these two events right here along with these two handlers. Make sure to keep the indentation the exact same as this will cause issues for you if you don't. And finally, we need to update the configuration to add the start block and change the contract address to the main proxy contract address. So once again, I am just going to use this right here. Make sure to use the exact same as me. Now, go ahead and open up the source mappings TS file, where we're going to write the mappings that we defined in our subgraph subgraph event handlers. So once again, I have pre-done this for you and we're just gonna get rid of all this code, all of this template code and make it reflect what we want, which is the token and the user schemas. And here is the code. So once again, if you need this, I will be putting this in the description below. This is a great template for you to have. Now, these mappings will essentially handle events for when a new token is created, transferred, or updated. When these events fire, the mappings will save the data into the subgraph. And there we go. We are all done. Now let's run a build. So we're going to do this using the build command like so. Making sure that we are definitely in the project that we need to be. And next we are gonna to have to go back here and run the following command of the deploy section of the tutorial. So all I'm gonna do is grab this command, graph auth, and once again, I'm just gonna replace the necessary fields. So this time I'm gonna need the access token, which is gonna be unique to you and you can find it right here. And I'm just gonna run that command. 
Now, we're just gonna have to wait for that to do its thing. And finally, I'm just going to grab this command to deploy our graph, making sure to once again, replace the GitHub name and the subgraph name. So this is my GitHub name. Please go ahead and use your own. And whatever you called your subgraph, just make sure that is the same and run the command. And there we have it. We have deployed our subgraph. You can see it here. And then if you go back to your dashboard, you will see the subgraph show up right there. Wonderful. So once we have that, we have deployed our subgraph. It is now time to start querying the foundation app NFT space to see if we can return back NFTs as well as their owners, IDs, and so on. So let's do it. So this should spin up a playground similar to probably ones you've seen before if you have used GraphQL before. As you will see, there are some schemas on the right. You will see there are the schemas that we defined, so the token schema and the user schema that we can use now to write our queries. A query has been generated for us also, the example query. So if I click this button right here, it will run. And you will see the URIs for the content as well as the token IDs and the token IPFS paths. So wonderful. This is looking good. Now let's try write our own query. So I'm going to do this from scratch and I can also use the schema to help me do this. So for example, if I want to query tokens, these are the things that I can get returned back to me. So I'm just going to go ahead and start doing this now. This is the syntax for querying things using GraphQL. So I just want to return back tokens like so. And the tokens that I want to return, well, I want to get back each token's ID, as you can see here, as well as each token's token ID, which is a different type of ID. And I also want to pick out the token IPFS path. So as you can see, we don't need to pick all the fields. These are the only three that I want to return. So I can literally pick and choose what I want returned. I could have picked the owner. I could have picked the creator. I could have picked the timestamp. I could have picked the name, but I have just chosen these three. And if we run that, there we go. Another neat thing that can be done is that I can order the order in which I want these tokens to come back to me in. So if I want to do this, all I have to do is write the order by and order it by the ID, as well as add an order direction. So making sure that is in between two parentheses, I'm going to choose the order direction to be descending. And if I run this, you will see the token ID starts at 99999. And if I go ahead and put ascending, so ASC for ascending, it will start at one. So there we go. Let's just change that back to descending maybe for now. I can also skip the first 100. So for example, if I put skip 100, just like so, and run this, then the first 100 tokens will be skipped. Great. Now let's perhaps look at the users. So once again, I'm just going to use this syntax to return back the users. And if we have a look at the schema, we can see that we can choose the ID, the tokens. And because we have derived this, I can now use the token schema to get back tokens. Okay, so hopefully you can see what we have done there with the derived from tag that you saw earlier. I am essentially using the user token schema and I've now sort of made a relationship between the token schema and the user schema. So now once again, I can choose to order the tokens just like we did before. And this time perhaps let's do it by the timestamp. So I could just choose created at timestamp option. And wonderful. Please do have a go around at playing here before moving on to the next section. 
In this part of the tutorial, I'm going to be showing you how to build a front end using React quickly in order to display the data in our browsers. So all the data that you see here, I'm going to be showing you how to get it to here. Okay, so let's get to it. Super simple. Let's do it. If you do not know React or would like to use some sort of other framework for the front end, please feel free, but please do have a go at watching long anyway to get the general concepts. The two packages that we are going to need for this part of the tutorial are Urkel and GraphQL. You will see them right here. Urkel allows us to rapidly use GraphQL in our applications without complex configuration or large API overhead. And the GraphQL package will allow us to write queries in this format right here in our front end. So to get going, we're going to have to grab our query HTTP path. In fact, if you would like to actually use any of the subgraphs, you can go ahead and do so. So I'm just going to show you how to do that before moving on. So right on here, just select the Graph Explorer and we can choose any of these really. So perhaps let's go ahead and choose the art blocks one, and then you will be able to view the query, the URL query that you will need. So for example, to use art blocks, I would need to get this query URL. Okay. And that's really it. So now that we know that let's go ahead and get our own query URL from the subgraph we have made. So I'm just going to gravitate back to my dashboard where we made the foundation app subgraph and I'm just going to go ahead and click on it. And here we go. Here is my query URL. That is the URL that I need to make the queries. So just make a mental note of that. Now let's get to creating our front end app. So all I'm going to do is once again, gravitate to my WebStorm projects. And in this directory, I'm going to use the command npx create react app, and then whatever I want to call my app. So I'm just going to call it my graph studio in order to spin up a react app fast with configuration with files. So everything will essentially be done for me. If you want to read more about this command, please go ahead and check it out here. It is one that I use often in my project so that we can get to the coding part quickly. So once this has finished running at the moment, it's just getting all the necessary files I need and all the configuration, then we should get ready to start our project. And there we go. We are now done. So now I just need to go into the project I made. So I called it my graph project. So I'm going to go into there. And I now need to install the packages that I discussed. So Urkel and GraphQL. And I'm just going to wait for those to install. And I'm just going to open up my project. So once again, I am using WebStorm. So I'm just going to open up WebStorm again. And there you will see foundation app subgraph that we made in the last section. And I'm just going to open up the newest directory that we have made, which is called my graph project. And in here, ta-da! you will see all the files necessary to get going with create react app. So I'm not going to talk you through these. Hopefully you know this command already. And now to start the app, I'm just going to use the command npm run start like so. And that will spin up my app on localhost 3000. There we go. This is what it should look like. Now, if we look back in our projects and check out the package JSON, you will see the Urkel package and you will also see the GraphQL package along with their version. So if anything is not working for you right now, it could be because you're using a newer version. If that is so, just revert back to this version and run npm i, so npm install again to reinstall all these packages. Okay, let's move on. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is just in the app.js file, I'm going to import create client from Urkel, so the package that we just installed. And I'm also going to import use effect and use state from React. Okay, so those are literally the only three things we need. Now, even though we are not importing GraphQL here, we still do need it. So don't think that that was installed without a reason. 
Next, I'm going to put my URL in here. So the query URL, I'm going to save it in this project. Let's save it as const URL and let's just go ahead and grab it. So I'm just going to get that here and just paste it as a string like so. The next thing we need to do is use our query. So I'm going to define this as query and I am going to put some backticks in here because we need the backticks in order for this to work. And I'm just going to get this query, the example query that we have in our playground. OK, if I run it, it should return this data. So that's the data that I want returned. So let's grab it and let's just paste it in our project like so. So super simple. There we go. The next thing that I want to do is actually start a client. So let's define a client and I'm going to use create client that we imported from the package our call and then we're just going to pass through the URL. Maybe let's call this something different. I'm going to call this API URL like so. And the next thing that I'm going to do is just fetch the data. So for this, I'm going to write a function. It's called fetch data and it's an async function. And in here, I'm going to use the client that I defined and I'm going to use query, which is a method that comes with it and pass through the query and then use the method to promise on it. So again, this is just the query that we have defined and I'm going to await this and then catch the response once it resolves. So once the promise resolves and I'm just going to console log it out so we can see it in our browser. Now this function, I'm going to put in a use effect. So just go ahead and do that in order for this to work and let's check it out. So now if I inspect the browser, you should see a response with the object, which has the data and the tokens and the users coming back to me. Okay, so exactly the same as we saw in our playground, we are now seeing this in our browser. Wonderful. Okay, so this is pretty much it. If you want to actually see it in the browser as well, I'm just going to quickly show you how to do that. Maybe let's just show the content URI and the token ID. So all I'm going to do is just save the tokens to state. We can do this using use state or the use state react hook. So let's go ahead and do that now. Const tokens and then set tokens. And I'm going to start off with state being null. So at the moment, tokens is null. And we're going to use set tokens in order to change the value of tokens to something else. So I am now going to get the response data tokens because we just want the tokens really. And I'm going to use set tokens in order to change the value of tokens to the tokens that are coming back to us with the response. And once again, we want to display this in the browser. So I'm just going to get rid of all this template code. And if tokens exist, I want to map each token. Once again, we need the index as well because we're going to have to add a key to the wrapping div. So let's make a wrapping div and then just pass through the key of index. And we're not using it, so I'm just going to put in a little underscore like so. And now we are going to have to, I'm going to make these uh, a tags. And if we click on them, it's going to take us to the token content URI. And it's going to open up a new tab. And then perhaps let's also have the, let's have the token ID. So ta-da! Now, if we click on the token, URI, it will take us to all of this information here. This is pretty neat. And then we can also see our token ID next to it. Wonderful. So we're getting the data back. We're displaying it. Of course, please be more inventive. Feel free to display your data however you wish. This is essentially the steps into getting that data showing up on your front end. If you want to use perhaps a different subgraph that might come back with different data that you can use in different ways as well. So the world is really your oyster with this. Okay, so we've covered a lot so far. Now the final part is going to be all about managing your API keys and billing for your studio.
So we're just going to head over to the Subgraph Studio by navigating here. Now the first thing that you are going to need is to have a wallet set up. I'm going to be using MetaMask for this tutorial, so I'm just going to show you quickly how to get set up. So I'm just going to show you quickly how to get set up with MetaMask just in case that you haven't before. First off, just gravitate towards MetaMask.io and simply install the Chrome extension. Once that is done, you should see a little fox show up here. And if you click on it, this browser should show up. Now let's go ahead and click Get Started. As we are new, I'm going to go ahead and create a new wallet and just go through these steps. Go ahead and create your password, making sure that it is unique to you. Finally, after clicking next, you're going to get some secret recovery phrases. These are super important. Don't disclose them to anyone. I'm going to be sharing them with you here as my wallet is not going to be active. So here are my secret words. And I'm just going to have to confirm my secret recovery phrases by dragging and dropping them in the correct order. So once again, do not save this with anyone. Keep it super safe as if anyone has this, they will be able to access your wallet. And there we go. So that is it. We are now set up. I have a MetaMask wallet. Let's continue. So now it's going to prompt me to connect with my wallet. I am going to go ahead and do that. And my wallet should pop up in the corner like so. And there we go. Super simple. Just go ahead and click next through these. And once we are done, go ahead and click on the billing tab. Here, you will see your billing balance as well as any costs that you have incurred in the billing period. Now, to enable billing, this is important, you must have Ether and GRT in your MetaMask wallet. So these two things are important in order to get set up. This is what your dashboard should look like if they are. It should give you the option to deposit GRT to your billing balance. Billing is covered on the Matic sidechain in order to decrease transaction times as well as transaction costs. In this step, we are going to move GRT to the Matic network. So I'm just going to put in the value of 25 and approve and confirm. Once the GRT is successfully moved to the Matic network, we can now switch to the Matic network. To view more details on the Matic network, please visit docs.matic.network forward slash docs develop network details slash network, as you can see in the URL right here. Here, you'll see the details that we need to import into our MetaMask wallet, including the network name, the chain ID, and the RPC address. So now let's go ahead and add that to our MetaMask wallet. So I'm just going to click on settings and gravitate towards networks. And now we're going to manually add the network. So once again, I'm just going to add the network name, the chain ID and the RPC. Once the network is configured in your MetaMask wallet, we can now move on to the next step. We can now move our GRT from our wallet balance into our billing balance. So let's just go ahead and confirm this, add GRT and confirm. And great, you will see our billing balance has been updated. After all these steps have been taken, we are now ready to create our API key. So. All I'm going to do is gravitate towards the API key drop down and I'm simply going to create an API key. So we can obviously rename it here and let's go ahead. Once our new API key is created, we can now scope it down to authorized subgraphs and authorized domains. To scope an API key to a subgraph, we first need the subgraph ID. Subgraph IDs can be found here. So just go ahead and find the subgraph ID you need. So this one right here and paste it like so. And there we go. So the whole reason we did this is so that we are now enabled to use the pull together subgraph. Okay. We are now authorized to use it. Thanks to this API key. And there we have it.
We have now finished the tutorial all about querying on the blockchain. So in conclusion, what we have learned is how to build subgraphs, how to hook up a front end to use our subgraph, and then how to manage our API keys and billing. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.